Jesus is always with you. Good morning. Welcome to St. Andrew's Virtual Worship Service. My name is Jeff Smith, and I have the privilege of serving as pastor here. We are so glad that you've joined us. A few announcements and some good news before we begin our worship together. Today during worship, we'll be serving communion. And so pause this service if needed and go gather the communion elements from your home, any of them, any common elements that can be used to celebrate the Lord's Supper later in the service. The session has recently formed a task force to study and plan how best to begin in-person worship at St. Andrews. While they do their work, the staff thought it would be an effective intermediary step to propose creating small groups to worship together in homes this summer. This would allow us to minimize exposure to the virus and yet keep connection in our St. Andrews community until in-person worship begins. Groups would watch the virtual service together in homes, pray for one another, and fellowship together. To minimize exposure to the virus, our goal is for people to choose a group and commit to that group for the summer. Amy and I would like to invite you to come and pray tonight at St. Andrews in our parking lot anytime between 8 and 9 p.m. Please bring your own chair and face mask. We will have candles and a format for our prayers. We will pray for our heartbroken nature, nation and confess our sins to God. We are commanded in Scripture to pray at all times. This is a clear time for the need for prayer and confession of sin. Please join us. Jane Whitney's Celebration and Retirement Parade was postponed at the last minute last Sunday due to rain. Jane was so excited that even so, I think she said around 60 of you came by to say hello even in the rain. She was so thrilled. But we postponed it also till June the 14th. There'll be more information and details in the weekly emails. Or you could contact a staff member. And now for some good news. Bank of America announced yesterday that it's committing $1 billion over four years in additional support to help local communities address economic and racial inequality, especially in the wake of the COVID-related economic downturn and health care needs. There's good news also on the finding a cure for COVID front. Some of you may remember at St. Andrews in our Science and Faith series on the human body that we studied CRISPR, which is a genetic engineering tool that uses a sequence of DNA and its associated protein to edit the base pairs of a gene. I know, I don't understand it either. And it has recently been announced that a group of scientists are finding progress in a CRISPR solution to COVID-19. They seek to use it to scramble the virus's genetic code, which would neutralize the coronavirus and stop it from replicating inside of cells. Also, a 16-year-old named Stefan Perez began marching against racial injustice into downtown Detroit with about 15 people. More and more joined him until he became an unwitting leader of a large crowd. At the end of the march, After no looting or fights, he urged the protesters to comply with the city's 8 p.m. curfew so that no one would get hurt. Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan heard about him and even called him and said this to him on Facebook Live. Son, I was watching the video and I saw your leadership. I have tears in my eyes. You are everything that's special about the city of Detroit. We're going to fight this injustice because of people like you. And now for some local good news. As I mentioned in my midweek devotional this past week, 
our mayor and our chief of police joined in solidarity with 60,000 protesters in taking a knee for George Floyd in Discovery Green. And it's that kind of change that our own Lauren Anger, who's a senior this coming year at Lamar High School, is hoping for when she organized an event this past Friday at Evelyn's Park called Letter Writing for Change. Letters were written to the Police Oversight Board, the Houston City Council, and Mayor Turner asking for an increase in training requirements and to implement a hard focus on social and cultural awareness. So proud of your leadership, Lauren. And now it's time for us to be grateful. I know this week may be a hard week to think about gratitudes. In times like these, it may be difficult for us to find things to be grateful for. But one thing I'm grateful for is that I see signs that culturally things may be different this time around. Crowds are more diverse with many races represented. More policemen and women are showing visible signs of solidarity with the protesters. A sign that this time, maybe real change in police interactions with minorities is possible. My prayer is that you would find some heartfelt things to be grateful for God as well. Love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me Everyone needs forgiveness The kindness of a Savior The hope of nations He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the
Good morning, boys and girls. How are you? I wish we could be together today, but I brought something. Do you remember this? It must be something very special because it's gold. And it kind of looks like a present for you. Should we open it? Look what's inside. It's pretty brown. Let's see what else. Hmm. I don't know. I think if we put that there and this here, now we have a road. Okay, I think we're ready to begin. There was once someone who was so wonderful and said such amazing things that people followed him and they wanted to know everything that he knew. They would ask him many questions. One day a person asked him what the most important thing in life is. The person he asked said, you already know. That is true. I do know it is to love God and love our neighbor as ourself. The person paused while he thought, and then he asked another question but who is my neighbor? The person he asked this to told this parable. There was once someone who went from Jerusalem to Jericho. And as he went along his way, he was attacked by robbers. They hurt him and they took everything he had and they left him for dead. There was also a priest who was coming down that same road. And as he went along his way, he came to the place where the man who had been hurt and had everything taken and was half dead was lying. And the priest walked around him and went on his way down the road. There was someone else who came. He worked at the temple in Jerusalem. And he was one of the people who helped the priest. He helped with the music. He was called a Levite. When the Levite came to the place where the person was who was hurt, and had had everything taken and was half dead, he too walked around him and went on his way. There was also a person who went on the road who did not live in Jerusalem. He was from a country called Samaria. And the people in Samaria did not like the people from Jerusalem. And the people from Jerusalem did not like the people from Samaria. But as he traveled down the road and came to the person who was hurt and had everything taken and was laying half dead on the side of the road, he knelt down and helped him. And he cleaned up his wounds and he put him on his donkey and he took him along the way down to the inn. And he paid the innkeeper that, so that he would have a place to stay and spend the night. The stranger was with him all night and he cared for him. Now, I wonder who is this man's neighbor? Do you think it is him? Do you think it is him? Could it be one of these guys? Could it be this one? I wonder who is 
his neighbor. Could it be them? Or him? Or them? We could also wonder who could be his neighbor? Do you think it could be this guy? Or him? I wonder. I wonder what would happen if all the people in this story were women instead of men. I wonder what would happen if the stranger who came upon the man was a child. Oh no, there's lots to think about. And I hope that you will continue to open up your mind and think about all of the things that are in this story. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you so much for your stories, for these parables that teach us so much. May we open up our hearts and our minds to find all that you have in store for us. And all God's children said, Amen. Our first scripture for today is the eighth psalm of the book of Psalms. It has been called the song of the astronomer, as gazing at the heavens inspires the psalmist to meditate on God's creation and man's place in it. And I will be reading from the New International Version. Now I invite you along with me to give reverent attention to this reading of Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea all that swim the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of God for the children of God. Praise be to his name. And now let us pray. Father, we are grateful that you have chosen to have an intimate relationship with each of us. And we thank you for giving us this avenue of prayer to come into your presence and to speak with you. Please hear the prayer we share with you using words. Please also hear the prayer we offer you that is beyond what our words can convey. Gracious and loving God, we are in awe at the perfection of your creation. You made the skies and the heavens and all the stars. You made the earth and the seas and everything in them. You give breath to everyone, life to everyone who walks the earth. You desire us to live in peace and harmony with you and with others in your creation. But our sinfulness and hard-heartedness push us away from healthy relationships and lapse us into conflict and enmity. We would rather talk about people instead of talking to people. We would rather dismiss than try to understand. We would rather avoid and ignore and blame instead of seeking healing and wholeness. Forgive us for our divisive and sinful behavior. Heal our brokenness. Move us to seek reconciliation. Restore our hearts to your perfect design. By grace, forgive us. In mercy, meet us. By your Holy Spirit, equip us to walk in the newness of a life with Christ. 
Father, we lift up into your care in many places in our country and in our city where there is chaos, conflict, uncertainty, and sorrow. Where we are separated from our brothers and sisters by events of history, by violence, economic disparity, ancestry, politics, religious beliefs, and the color of our skin. Please bless us with a season of peace. Bless us with the respite from the horrors afflicted on our children through the hatred of man. Heal the divisions that separate us. Mend our broken hearts. Bring an end to violence. We pray for the relief of suffering, for tolerance, for inclusiveness, and for human kindness. Father, we lift up those in our own lives that we love and care for that find themselves in circumstances they have not chosen who are longing to find any sense of normalcy, that are tired and weary, that face loneliness and isolation, that are discouraged from illness and hardship, that feel lost and alone spiritually. We ask for your steadying influence. Give hope when we feel there is none. Give strength when our resolve is gone. Whisper words of comfort to the suffering, words of tenderness to the fainting, and words of direction to the confused. Father, you have given each of us so many gifts in our own lives. Help us to know how and where we are to use these gifts for your kingdom. Fill each of us with your Holy Spirit. Kindle our passion to serve you. Inspire courage in us today so that we can confidently face the challenges in our path and live faithfully before others. Empower each of us to be in a powerful witness to our world trapped in darkness. Victorious Lord, we thank you for giving us victory over sin and triumph over death through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. Thank you for the assurance that our future rests in your hands, that you will one day deliver us into your kingdom that is to come, a new heaven and a new earth where there will be no sin, no sickness, where you will calm every fear and wipe away every tear. May we live today with confidence and great joy as we proclaim, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And now let us join our voices together as we pray the prayer your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Would you pray with me? Most gracious God, our hearts break at the pain and the anguish that we've witnessed over these last few weeks, at the death of George Floyd and all the pain that has come with it. We pray, Lord, that you would help us individually and as a church to know how to respond, to know, Lord, who you call us to be in a world that seems to be crumbling around us. Give us your spirit and your peace, your wisdom, that we might be Christ to the world. To that end, Lord, I pray that you would pour upon me the gift of preaching, that my very frail and broken and human words might, for the power of your Holy Spirit, become your living word, uniquely crafted for each and every one of our hearts. We pray this with great confidence, for we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. The scripture this morning comes from Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20, the English Standard Version. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Today's scripture is taken from the lectionary readings for this week. It includes the Great Commission, where Jesus commands the church to make disciples of every tribe, tongue, and nation. Jesus' command matches perfectly with last week's sermon on Pentecost, where we learned that at the moment the church was founded, as the Spirit descended upon the church for the first time, the evidence of the Spirit's coming was multicultural, multiracial, multilingual. Every foreigner there heard the message of the Spirit in their own tongue. And in our first reading which is also assigned by the lectionary, we join with David in pondering the question, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. Here once again, there is no distinction among races, cultures, or languages. Mankind and human being, these are clear designations for all humans. All of us are crowned with glory and honor, it proclaims. All of us are given the exact same charge to rule over the works of God's hands. We're called to do this together. What does it mean to make disciples of all nations? What does that look like? That's what we're going to talk about today. The message from these key texts is helpful. They are not only evidence of God's heart for every people and every race, it is also evidence of the prioritization of the multicultural reality of God's kingdom. And by kingdom, I don't just mean church and worship and discipleship. I mean God's kingdom coming, which is more than the church. It's how governments are run and how justice is handled, how prejudice is thwarted, how each and every person, each and every person, no matter race or culture, is treated with an equal amount of respect and dignity. That is the kingdom come that Jesus is talking about in today's Great Commission. Yet for what seems like the thousandth time, events this past month have proven that people of different races and cultures and colors are not treated equally. God's kingdom come is claimed more by some than others. Something that is related to all this that I believe God has hardwired into our DNA is the human desire for fairness or fair play. 
as I spent time talking with some of the minorities in our church family this week, the idea of fairness would come up, maybe not with those words, but it would come up especially in light of George Floyd and others in how minorities versus whites are treated by police who are called to serve and protect. How different the white person's experience is than the minorities. One church member told me that he has feared for his life at the hands of the police during a routine traffic stop. As a white male who's been stopped by the police numerous times, I've never in my life felt that way nor have 98% of other white people that I speak with. It's just a fundamentally different experience for us. In other words, it's not fair, and it's not equal. God's multiracial, make disciples of all nations kingdom cannot come as God intends until the most basic forms of fairness are in play. These are the internal struggles that we see outside of people expressed all over the country in over 140 cities this past week. People want things to be fair. They want things to be just. They want everyone treated equally and the same. There was a study done where two people were put in a room to play a game, a game like Monopoly, you might think. When the rules were read... The rules heavily favored one player over another in this experiment. This was clear from the start of the game for both players. Once the game was played, the one who benefited from the better rules won, of course. And yet, when they interviewed him about winning, the winner tended to take full credit for the win, not mentioning at all the benefiting rules that were the foundation of his success. The truth is, this isn't a bad analogy. For white Americans, the rules have benefited us for so long that we don't even see it anymore. And when whites win the game of life over minority players, we almost always take the full credit for our winnings, not mentioning our innate advantage. Even though Jesus' commission was for his disciples to include every tribe and nation and tongue, some of Jesus' disciples experience a whole other level of fairness in this life than others. I wonder, what does Jesus think about this? And what is Jesus demanding of those disciples who are taking advantage of the rules to advance not God's kingdom, but their own kingdom, or cause. This question humbles me. Greg Boyle, a priest who works with gang members in Los Angeles, speaks to this when he writes, the wrong idea has taken root in the world. And the idea is this, there just might be some lives out there that matter less than other lives. Compassion isn't just about feeling the pain of others. It's about bringing them in toward yourself. If we love what God loves, then in compassion, margins get erased. Be compassionate as God is compassionate means the dismantling of barriers that exclude. What are the barriers that exclude? I'm sure you've heard the term systemic racism, and this term refers to all the ways that over many, many years, the rules of our country have benefited white culture in America. From a scriptural standpoint, such systems, such systematic ways of dominating another, in that sense, that benefit some and hold others back, In Scripture, these are related to spiritual forces of darkness. And these spiritual forces of darkness are sinful. They work against Jesus' great commission and the coming of God's kingdom. Here's a key Scripture from Ephesians 6. 
Paul is writing, and he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. The devil's schemes are involved in systemic ways in our world. Our struggle is not against one another, even though it appears that way, but but against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is sin writ large. And I'm asking you today to join me in considering this idea, a what-if scenario, that structures can be sinful and we can participate in keeping those sins going without even knowing it or being aware of it. And how, if that's true, we have a responsibility to repent of those structures and change them. What do such forces look like in America? I've spoken, as I said, with some minorities in our church family, and I've sought to learn how systemic racism has impacted their lives. And from beginning to end, their testimonies are powerful and devastating. And they are impossible to ignore. These St. Andrews minority members that I know and love They affirm the impact of systemic racism upon them at every stage of their lives. So let's try this on. What do I mean by systemic racism? How are the spiritual powers in the heavenly realms breaking down our world with sin in a systematic fashion? Well, one place that's got some great resources about this is Fuller Seminary. It's a historically evangelical seminary. It's a wonderful school. And I began to investigate some of their resources on systemic racism, and I'm going to be relying on their writings a lot in the references that I make over the next few minutes. Fuller states this, racialized violence is never isolated. It's never an isolated incident because it is inherently wrapped up in the context of societal structures rooted in particular ideas about race and its function in our culture. Naming one person's racism is unhelpful if we cannot name the systemic issues perpetuating racism in our country, including the structural and institutional layers. What are some of the structural and institutional layers? I'm going to mention just three or four today. Some of them will be really obvious to you. Some of them may not be so. The first is slavery. Though it happened centuries ago, the kidnapping, shipping, selling, and outright owning of other human beings still impacts both African Americans and American whites today. Many African Americans I know are aware of ancestors who were owned by whites. This has a long-term psychological impact on them. And for myself, because of rec- from a disputed will in my family history. I know that my own ancestor owned a slave, a human being that was literally treated as a part of this person's estate. To be dispersed upon my ancestor's death along with his cattle and his land and his farming implements. Such truths don't just go away like we want them to just because they happened a long time ago. These horrible facts cannot be denied and swept under the carpet. We can't just say to people, white or black, hey, it was a long time ago, just get over it. It needs to be healed. There are deep wounds here, as there should be. So first is slavery. Second are Jim Crow laws. Following emancipation from slavery, Jim Crow laws were state and local laws that enforced racial racial segregation in the southern states. 
Beginning in the late 19th century, after Reconstruction, these laws were enforced all the way until 1964 with the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Late 19th century, 1964. These did not end until after I was born. As a body of law, Jim Crow institutionalized economic, educational, and social disadvantages for African Americans living in the South. Once the laws were reversed in the 60s and integration was legislated, whites found other ways to continue to separate themselves, among other things regarding the quality of education. To this day, schools located in the inner cities and in African American neighborhoods are extremely underfunded compared to schools like West U Elementary. Education is not equal 55 years later. So we have slavery, we have Jim Crow laws, we have a practice called redlining. Redlining, most of us know, is that mechanism that governments used to determine where businesses should thrive and not thrive, who should own homes and not own homes. And most of us know that a key saving mechanism for the building of wealth is home ownership. In the 1930s, the government created color-coded maps like this one of Houston to determine which neighborhoods were viable for for development. These policies existed from 1934 to 1968. And as a result, 98% of home loans went to white people who were then able to build equity after the Great Depression. Equity that continued to build generation after generation until my parents have equity to hand down to me, and my prayer is we will have equity to hand down to our children and so on. While people of color were driven into greater poverty, that poverty has dire implications for them and their descendants today. Redlining-type practices continue today. Such data informs businesses where to open offices or where to stay away. Just visit our historic wards here in Houston, and you will see the vast desert in these areas when it comes to home ownership, access to the services they need for medical care, access to major name banking industry who might loan them money, and to be able to find fresh foods in good grocery stores. After slavery and Jim Crow, after redlining, you have the justice system on top of that. Not only are the African American community consistently treated differently by the police, which we were talking about earlier, our justice system, while being the best in the world, is still showing its bias against the poor and African Americans in particular. If you saw the movie Just Mercy, and if you haven't, please do. It's a phenomenal movie. It gives one powerful, true example of how unjust our justice system is in the way it treats particularly African American men. Once those men have been found guilty or pressured to plead guilty of something As a felon, they then become permanent second-class citizens in our country with limited rights. These are just some of the forces at work that systematically hold African Americans back. While each of these historic biases is horrible in and of itself and hurts countless African Americans, when you combine them, They systematically wield a power together that ensures African Americans do not get to play the game of life fairly or equally. This is how, from the beginning of the game of Monopoly that I was talking about, whites are ensured the rules are to their advantage. It's like playing the first 15 rounds and the whites collect $200 in Pasco and collect a whole stack of of get-out-of-jail-free cards while the African Americans collect nothing and get sent to jail again and again. If you've ever played, you know you can't win that way. 
For the game of life in America is built upon the premise that everyone has equal opportunity and access to everything they need to compete. Equal education, the equal opportunity to build wealth, the equal opportunity to be hired for a job in which they are qualified to apply, the equal opportunity when being accused of breaking the law. And yet the data and African-American personal experiences do not lie. They do not have an equal playing field. And so much of the hurt and the pain and anger that we see coming out of people onto the streets right now are a result of generations of holding this anger and frustration in about how fundamentally unfair things are. And those of us in America who are white, and we benefit from the way systemic racism skews the rules of our, in our favor, as overwhelmingly difficult as it is, we must face these disparities and risk whatever it takes to fight that such racism would end. And so what now? What do we do? What are you asking of us, Jeff? First, Jesus commanded that we make disciples of all nations. And he taught us to pray for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done on the whole earth as it is in heaven. And for that to happen, for God's will to be done, systemic racism must be faced, especially by those of us who call ourselves Jesus' disciples. And so how do we do that? Well, the first a key for those of us who are white is to listen to our minority brothers and sisters. Listen. Be empathetic, compassionate. Try to understand what it would be like for generations of systemic racism to be weighed upon generation after generation and what that must feel like and what it creates as they try to live their lives and make their way in the world. Here's what I've heard from some of our St. Andrew's minorities. They realize that this is just the beginning of the conversation for St. Andrew's, but they have a strong hope that we would commit to continue forward at St. Andrew's, that we as a community would really engage and not take the easy way out. They want to spend significant time really talking about racism in light of our faith, in a way that God might use to help lead to change. Folks, that is an incredibly fair request. And because of this, I want each of you to know that a part of St. Andrew's mission going forward will include studying the issue and evidence for systemic racism and beginning that conversation around what God is calling St. Andrew's to do in response that His kingdom may come. In 2021, our Science and Faith series, remember we did a series on the human body. We're going to come back and revisit that series and use it as a vehicle to talk about some of these issues surrounding the human body and our race. And second... As I mentioned during the announcements, I'm hoping that you will drop by and join Amy and I tonight between 8 and 9 p.m. in the church parking lot that we may come together and lament as we implore God to come and to heal our land. Would you take action? This is something you can tangibly do is come before God as a community and appeal to Him and ask for God's intervention in our country. Would you take action in this way tonight? I hope you'll join me. And now would you pray with me? Lord God, the same God who sent your Spirit, speaking in every language on that first Pentecost, and with it a demonstration that every tongue and tribe is being included in your church, everyone treated equally. I come before you brokenhearted today. I confess that I have not sought the diversity Jesus demands of us in His great commission to reach all nations. I have not treated everyone equally. 
but it gets worse, Lord. I confess that I personally and my family and many of my friends have benefited from the systemic racism in our country and that at times, even when I was made aware of how I benefited, I chose to do nothing about it. Forgive me, Lord. I repent, O Lord, of such sin. And today I turn from that sin and I begin following You, Jesus, afresh and anew as Your disciple. And as Your disciple, I promise that from this day forward I will seek to live my life acknowledging such privilege and benefits and seeking to do all I can to change the rules so that everyone, every one has an equal opportunity to thrive in this time. And I pray for our St. Andrew's family that we would have the courage communally to take serious the idea that structures can be sinful and we can participate in keeping those sins going without really thinking about it. Lord, may we have the courage to come alongside the minorities in our church community whom we know and we love and begin the conversation that needs to be had. And Lord, if we do that, we would begin to take responsibility to repent of those structures and seek to change them. As I pray this prayer, Lord, the enormity of the task to which you call us overwhelms. I feel so inadequate, so small, so insignificant. But you, Lord, your Spirit can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so we come to this table today needing the power of your grace to give us the courage to follow you, Jesus, as you lead us to creating a world where everyone is treated with equal dignity and respect. Help us, Lord, to fulfill the great commission of making disciples from every tongue, tribe, and nation and doing all we can to ensure that each of us is equally given the same opportunities. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We come together today to celebrate the Lord's Supper. As we gather at this table, we celebrate God's love and grace in Jesus Christ. This is not St. Andrew's table, and this is not a Presbyterian table. This is a table for all who claim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So now let us pray. Gracious God, today you have called us together to be the church. Unite us now at your table. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these common elements that we bring to you today in your honor as we join together to share them as one body of Christ. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took the loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. And he said, take eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of the sins of many. Anytime you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And the Apostle Paul adds that anytime we eat this bread or we drink this cup, we remember the risen Lord's death until he comes again. The feast of God for the people of God. the surface of my anxious imagination beckons a calmness that
that is found in you alone. It washes over every doubt, every imperfection. Jesus, your presence is the comfort of my soul. There's no
Father from whom all things come and all praise to Christ Jesus, God's only Son and all praise to the Spirit who makes us one and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love, yes they'll Jesus said to his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples from every nation and teaching them my commandments. And what are his commandments? His commandments are to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself, to love your enemies. He says that they will know that we are Christians by the way we love one another. And we can't do this on our own. It's too much for us. Jesus says at the end, remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And it's there, right there, that we begin to discover what it takes to love our neighbor as ourself from every nation, every language, every tribe. It's the power of Jesus' grace alive within us, the thing that we just experienced in communion together. When we experience that grace and let it come alive in our hearts, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or even imagine according to His power that is at work within us. And so to Him and Him alone be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus our Lord from this day forward, now and forevermore. May it be so.